How's it going? Welcome to theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California for a special presentation on cloud native at scale, enabling super cloud modern applications with Platform 9. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We've got a great lineup of three interviews we're streaming today. Medora Maskaski, who's the co-founder and VP of product of Platform 9. She's going to go into details around Arlon, the open source products, and also the value of what this means for infrastructure as code and for cloud native at scale. Bick Lee, the chief architect of Platform 9, CUBE alumni going back to the OpenStack days, he's going to go into why Arlon, why this infrastructure as code implication, what it means for customers and the implications in the open source community and where that value is. Really great wide ranging conversation there. And of course, Baskar Gorty, the CEO of Platform 9 is going to talk with me about his views on super cloud and why Platform 9 has a scalable solution to bring cloud native at scale. So enjoy the program, see you soon. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California for a special program on cloud native at scale, enabling next generation cloud or super cloud for modern application cloud native developers. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. A pleasure to have here Medora Maskaski, co-founder and VP of product at Platform9. Thanks for coming in today for this cloud native at scale conversation. Thank you for having me. So cloud native at scale is something that we're talking about because we're seeing the, the next level of mainstream success of containers, Kubernetes, and cloud native develop, basically DevOps mm -hmm. in the CI CD pipeline. It's changing the landscape of infrastructure as code, it's accelerating the value proposition. And the super cloud, as we call it, has been gaining a lot of traction because this next generation cloud is looking a lot different, but kind of the same as the first generation. What's your view on super cloud as it fits to cloud native as scales up? Yeah, you know, I think what's interesting, and I think the reason why super cloud is a really good and a really fit term for this, and I think, I know my CEO was uh, chatting with you as well, and he was mentioning this as well, but I think um, there needs to be a different term than just multi-cloud or cloud. Uh, and the reason is because as cloud native and cloud deployments have scaled, I think we've reached a point now where instead of having the traditional data center style model where you have a few large distributions of infrastructure and workload at a few locations, um, I think the model is kind of flipped around, right? Where you have a large number of microsites. Um, these microsites could be your public cloud deployments, your private on-prem infrastructure deployments, or it could be your edge environment, right? And every single enterprise, every single industry is moving in that direction. And so you got to refer that with a terminology that, that, that indicates the scale and complexity of it. And so I think super cloud is, a, is an appropriate term for that. So you brought a couple of things I want to dig into. You mentioned um, edge nodes. Mm -hmm. We're seeing not only edge nodes being the next kind of area of innovation, mainly because it's just popping up everywhere and that's just the beginning. We don't even know what's around the corner. You got buildings, you got IOT, OT and IT kind of coming together. But you also got this idea of regions. Global infrastructure is a big part of it. I just saw some news around Cloudflare shutting down a site here. There's policies being made at scale, mm -hmm. these new challenges there. Can you share, because you can have edge, so hybrid cloud is a winning formula. Everybody knows that, it's a steady state. Yeah. But across multiple clouds brings in this new unengineered area yet. It hasn't been done yet. Um, spanning clouds, people say they're doing it, but you start to see the toe in the water. It's happening, it's going to happen. It's only going to get accelerated with the edge and beyond globally. So I have to ask you, what is the technical challenges uh, in doing this? Because there's some business consequences as well, but there are technical challenges. Can you share your view on what the technical challenges are for the super cloud across multiple edges and regions? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, in, in the context of this, the, this, this term of super cloud, I think it's sometimes easier to visualize things in terms of two axes, right? I think on one end, you can think of the scale in terms of just pure number of nodes that you have deployed, a number of clusters in the Kubernetes space. And then on the other axis, you would have your distribution factor, right? Which is, do you have these tens of thousands of nodes in one site, or do you have them distributed across tens of thousands of sites with one node at each site, right? And if you have just one flavor of this, there is enough complexity, but potentially manageable. But when you are expanding on both these axes, you really get to a point 
where that scale really needs some well thought out, well structured solutions to address it, right? Uh, a combination of homegrown tooling along with your you know, favorite distribution of Kubernetes is not a strategy that can help you in this environment. It may help you when you have one of this or when, you, when your scale is not at the level. Can you scope the complexity? Because, I mean, I hear a lot of moving parts going on there. Um, the technology is obviously getting better. We're seeing cloud native become successful. There's a lot to configure, mm -hmm. a lot to install. Can you scope the scale of the problem? Because we're talking about at scale yep. um, challenges here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I like to call it, um, you know, the, the problem that the scale creates. You know, there's various problems, but I think one one problem, one way to think about it is, is you know, it works on my cluster problem, right? So, uh, you know, I come from engineering background, and there's a, you know, there's a fav famous saying between engineers and QA and the support folks, right? Which is, it works on my laptop. Which is, I tested this chain, everything was fantastic. It worked flawlessly on my machine. On production, it's not working. And the exact same problem now happens in these distributed environments, but at massive scale, right? Which is that you know developers test their applications, etc., within the sanctity of their sandbox environments. But once you expose that change in the wild world of your production deployment, right? And the production deployment could be going at the radio cell tower at the edge location where a cluster is running there, or it could be sending you know, these applications and having them run at my customer site where they might not have configured that cluster exactly the same way as I configured it, or they configured the cluster right, but maybe they didn't deploy the security policies, or they didn't deploy the other infrastructure plugins that my app relies on. All of these various factors add their own layer of complexity, and there really isn't a simple way to solve that today. And that is just you know, one example of an issue that happens. I think another you know, whole new ballgame of issues come in the context of security, right? Because when you're deploying applications at scale in a distributed manner, you got to make sure someone's job is on the line to ensure that the right security policies are enforced regardless of that scale factor. So I think that's another example of um, problems that occur. Okay, so I have to ask about scale because there are a lot of multiple steps involved. When you see the success of cloud native, you know, you see some, you know, some experimentation. They set up a cluster, say it's containers and Kubernetes, and then you say, okay, we got this, we configure it. And then they do it again and again. They call it day two. Some people call it day one, day two operation, whatever you call it. Once you get past the first initial thing, then you got to scale it. Then you're seeing security breaches. You're seeing configuration errors. This seems to be where the hot spot is and when companies transition from, I got this to, oh no, it's harder than I thought at scale. Can you share your reaction to that and how you see this playing out? Yeah, so you know, I think um, it's interesting. There's multiple problems that occur uh, when you know the, the, the two factors of scale as we talked about start expanding. I think one of them is what I like to call the, um, you know, it, it works fine on my cluster problem, which is uh, back in when I was a developer, we used to call this, it works on my laptop problem, which is, you know, you have your perfectly written code that is operating just fine on your machine, your sandbox environment, but the moment it runs production, it comes back with P0s and P1s from support teams, et cetera, and those issues can be really difficult to triage, right? And so in the Kubernetes environment, this problem kind of multifolds. It goes, you know, escalates to uh, a higher degree uh, because yeah, you have your sandbox developer environments, they have their clusters, and things work perfectly fine in those clusters because these clusters are typically handcrafted or a combination of some scripting and handcrafting. And so as you give that change to then run at your production edge location, like say your radio cell tower site, or uh, you hand it over to a customer to run it on their cluster, they might not, not have configured that cluster exactly how you did, or they might not have configured some of the infrastructure plugins. And so the things don't work, and when things don't work, triaging them becomes nightmarishly hard. Right, it's just one of the examples of the problem. Another whole bucket of issues is security, which is as you have these distributed clusters at scale, you gotta ensure someone's job is on the line to make sure that the security policies are configured properly. So this is a huge problem, I love that comment. That's not, not happening on my system. It's the classic you know, debugging mentality. Yeah. Um, but at scale, it's hard to do that. With error prone, I can see that being a problem. And you guys have a solution you're launching. Can you share what Arlon is, this new product, what is it all about? Talk about this new introduction. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very, very excited 
Um, you know, it's uh, one of the projects that we've been working on for some time now because uh, we are very passionate about this problem and just solving problems at scale um, in on-prem or at in the cloud or at edge environments. And what Erlon is, uh, it's an open source project and it is uh, a tool, uh, it's a Kubernetes native tool for uh, complete end-to-end -end management of not just your clusters, but your clusters, all of the infrastructure that goes within and along the sites of those clusters, security policies, your middleware plugins, and finally, your applications. So what Arlon lets you do in a nutshell is in a declarative way, it lets you handle the configuration and management of all of these components and at scale. So what's the elevator pitch, simply put, for what this solves in, in terms of the chaos you guys are reigning in? What's the, what's the bumper sticker? What yeah. would it do? Um, there's a perfect analogy that I love to reference in this context, which is think of your assembly line you know, in a traditional, let's say, um, you, know, you know, an auto manufacturing factory or et cetera, and the level of efficiency um, at scale that that assembly line brings, right? Arlon, and if you look at the logo we've designed, it's this uh, funny little robot. And it's because when we think of Arlon, we think of these enterprise large scale environments, you know, sprawling at scale, creating chaos because there isn't necessarily a well thought through, well structured solution that's similar to an assembly line, which is taking each component, you know, addressing them, manufacturing, processing them in a standardized way, then handing to the next stage where again it gets, you know, processed in a standardized way. And that's what Arlan really does. That's like the elevator pitch. If you have problems of scale of managing your infrastructure, um, you know, that is distributed, Arlan brings the assembly line level of efficiency uh, and consistency. Um, for those so problems. keeping it smooth, the assembly line, things are flowing, mm -hmm. C CI, CD pipelining. Exactly. Um, so that's what you're trying to simplify that ops piece for the developer. I mean, it's not really ops, it's their ops, it's coding. Yeah, not just developer, the ops, the operations folks as well, right? Because developers, you know, there is, developers are responsible for one picture of that layer, which is my apps, and then maybe that middleware of applications that they interface with. But then they hand it over to someone else who's then responsible to ensure that these apps are secured properly, that they are logging, logs are being collected properly, uh, monitoring and observability is integrated, and so it solves problems for both those teams. Yeah, it's DevOps, so the DevOps is the cloud-native developer. Right. The ops right. teams have to kind of set policies. Is that where the declarative piece comes in? Is that why that's important? Absolutely, yeah, and, 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 and you know, Kubernetes uh, really in, it introduced or elevated this declarative management, right? Uh, because you know Kubernetes clusters are, yeah, or your yeah, you know specifications of components that go in Kubernetes are defined in a declarative way, and Kubernetes always keeps that state consistent with your defined state. But when you go outside of that world of a single cluster, and when you actually talk about defining the clusters or defining everything that's around it, there really isn't a solution that does that today. And so Arlan addresses that problem at the heart of it and it does that using existing open source well-known solutions. Adora, I want to get into the benefits, what's in it for me as the customer yep. developer, but I want to finish this out real quick and get your thoughts. You mentioned open source. Why open source? What's the, what's the current state of the product? You run the product group over there at Platform 9. Is it open source and you guys have a product that's commercial? Can you explain the open source dynamic and first of all, why open source? And yeah. what is the consumption? I mean, open source is great. People want open source. They can download it, look at the code, but you know, maybe want to buy the commercial. So I'm assuming you have that thought through. Can you share yeah. the open source and commercial relationship? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, starting with why open source, I think it's, you know, we as a company, we have, you know, one of the things that's absolutely critical to us is that we take mainstream open source technologies, components, and then we you know, make them available to our customers at scale through either a SaaS model or on-prem model, right? But so as we are a company, a startup, or a company that benefits, um, you know, in a massive way by this open source economy, um, it's only 
right, I think, in my mind, that we do our part of the duty, right, and contribute back to the community that feeds us. And so, um, you know, we have always held that strongly as one of our principles, uh, and we have, uh, you know, created and built independent products, starting all the way with Fission, which was a serverless product, you know, that, that we had built, um, uh, to various other, you know, examples that I can give. But that's one of the main reasons why open source. And also open source because we want the community to really firsthand engage with us yeah. on this problem, which is very difficult to achieve if your product is behind a wall, you know, behind behind a block box. Well, and that's, that's what the developers want too. I mean, what we're seeing in reporting with SuperCloud is, the new model of consumption is, I want to look at the code and see what's in there. That's right. And then also, if I want to use it, I'll, I'll do it. Great, that's yep. open source, that's the value. But then at the end of the day, if I want to move fast, that's when people buy in. So it's a new kind of freemium, I guess, business model. <laughs> I guess that's the way that it's all, but that's, that's the benefit of open source. This is why standards and open source is growing so fast. You have that confluence of, you know, a way for developers to try before they buy, but mm -hmm. also, actually kind of date the application, if you will. We, you know, Adrian Cock Cockroft uses the dating met metaphor, you know, hey, you know, I want to <laughs> check it out first before I get married. Right. Uh, and that's what open source, so this is the new, this is how people are selling. This is not just open source, this is how companies are selling. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, I think, and you know, two things. I think one is just, you know, this, this, this cloud native space is so vast um, that if you if you're building a closed flow solution, sometimes there's also a risk that it may not apply to every single enterprise's use cases. And so having it open source gives them an opportunity to extend it, expand it, to make it uh, proper to their use case if they choose to do so, right? Uh, but at the same time, um, what's also critical to us is we are able to provide a supported version of it with an SLA that we, you know, that's backed by us, um, a SaaS hosted version of it as well for those customers who choose to go that route. Um, you know, once they have used the open source version and loved it and want to take it at scale and in production and need 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 a partner to collaborate with who can, you know, support them. Uh, for that production environment. I have to ask you, now let's get into what's in it for the customer. I'm a customer. Yep. Why should I be enthused about Arlo? What's in it for me? Um, you know, because if I'm not enthused about it, I'm not going to be confident and it's going to be hard for me to get behind this. Uh, can you share your enthusiastic view of, you know, why sh I should be enthused about Arlo? If yeah, I'm a customer. absolutely. And so, and there's multiple, you know, um, enterprises that we talk to, many of them, you know, our customers, where this is a very kind of typical story that you will hear, which is um, we have, you know, a Kubernetes distribution, it could be on-premise, it could be public cloud native Kubernetes, and then we have our CICD pipelines that are automating the deployment of applications, et cetera. And then there's this gray zone. And the gray zone is, well, before you can, you, your CI/CD pipelines can deploy the apps, somebody needs to do all of that groundwork of, you know, defining those clusters and, you know, properly configuring them. And as these things, these things start by being done hand-grown, and then as, the, as you scale, what typically enterprises would do today is they will have their home homegrown DIY solutions for this. I mean, the number of folks that I talk to that have built Terraform automation and then, you know, some of those key developers leave. So it's a typical open source mm -hmm. or typical, you know, DIY challenge. And the reason that they're writing it themselves is not because they want to. Um, I mean, of course, technology is always interesting to everybody, but it's because they can't find a solution that's out there that perfectly fits the problem. And so that's that pitch. I think ops people would be delighted. The folks that we've talking, uh, you know, sp spoken with have been absolutely excited and have uh, you know shared that this is a major challenge we have today because we have uh, you know few hundreds of clusters on EKS Amazon and we want to scale them to a few thousands but we don't think we're ready to do that and this will give us the ability to Yeah I think to do people that. are scared not sca I won't say scared that's a bad word maybe I should say that they feel nervous because you know at scale <laughs> Small mistakes can become large mistakes. This is something that is concerning to enterprises. And, and, and I think this is going to come up at KubeCon this year where enterprises are going to say, okay, I need to see SLAs. I want to see track record. I want to see other companies that have used it. Yeah. Um, how would you answer that question to, or, or challenge? You know, hey, I love this, but 
is there any guarantees? Is there any, what's the SLAs? I'm an enterprise, I got tight. You know, I love the open source, kind of free, fast and loose, but I need hardened code. Yeah, absolutely. So, so two parts to that, right? One is R1 leverages existing open source components, products that are extremely popular. Two specifically. One is Arlan uses Argo CD, which is uh, probably one of the highest uh, rated and used um, CD open source tools that's out there, right? It's created by folks that are as part of Intuit team now, you know, really brilliant team, and it's used at scale across enterprises. That's one. Um, second is Arlan also makes use of cluster API, CAPI, which is a Kubernetes subcomponent, right, for lifecycle management of clusters. So there is enough of um, you, you know, community, users, et cetera, around these two products, right, or, or, or open source projects that will find Arlan to be right up in their alley because they're already comfortable, familiar with Ar Argo CD. Now Arlan just extends the scope of what Argo CD can do. And so that's one. And then the second part is going back to your point of the comfort, and that's where, you know, Platform 9 um, has a role to play, which is um, when you are ready to deploy Arlan at scale because you've been you know, playing with it in your dev test environments, you're happy with what you get with it, uh, then Platform 9 will stand behind it and provide that SLA. And what's been the reaction from customers you've talked to, Platform 9 customers with, with, um, that are familiar with, with Argo and then Arlo? Um, what's been some of the feedback? Yeah, I, I think the feedback's been fantastic. I mean, I can give you examples of customers where, uh, you know, initially, uh, it, you know, when you're when you're telling them about your entire portfolio of solutions, it might not strike a chord right away. But then we start talking about Arlon, and and we talk about the fact that it uses Argo CD, and they start opening up. They say we have standardized on Argo, and we have built these components homegrown. We would be very interested. Can we co-develop? Does it support these use cases? So we've had that kind of validation. We've had validation all the way at the beginning of Arlon, before we even wrote a single line of code saying this is something we plan on doing. And the customer said, if you had it today, I would have purchased it. So uh, it's been really great validation. All right, so uh, next question is, what is the solution to the customer? If I asked you, look, at, I have, I'm so busy. Um, my team's overworked. I got a skills gap. I don't need another project. It's, I'm so tied up right now and I'm just chasing my tail. Um, how does Platform 9 help me? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, one of the core tenets of Platform 9 has always been that we try to bring that public cloud-like simplicity by hosting, uh, you know, this and a lot of such similar tools in a SaaS-hosted manner for our customers, right? So our goal behind doing that is taking away or trying to take away all of that complexity from customers' hands and offloading it to our hands, right? And giving them that full white glove um, treatment, as we call it. And so, um, from a customer's perspective, one, something like Arlon will integrate with what they have, so they don't have to rip and replace anything. In fact, it will even, in the next versions, uh, it may even discover your clusters that you have today and you know, give you an inventory. And so customers cool. have clusters that are growing, that's a sign. Correct. Call you guys. Absolutely, either they're, they have massive, large clusters, right, that they want to split into smaller clusters, but they're not comfortable doing that today, mm -hmm. or they've done that already on, say, public cloud or otherwise, and now they have management challenges. So it's basically operationalizing the clusters, whether they want to kind of reset everything and remove things around and reconfigure, yep. and or scale out. That's right, exactly. And you provide and that layer of policy. Absolutely, That's yes. the key value here. That's right. So policy-based configuration, for well, cluster scale up. Profile and policy based declarative configuration and lifecycle management for clusters. If I asked you how this enables SuperCloud, what would you say to that? I think this is one of the key ingredients to SuperCloud, right? If you think about a SuperCloud environment, there's at least few key ingredients that, that come to my mind that are really critical, like they are, you know, life saving ingredients at that scale. One is having a really good strategy for managing that scale, you know, in a, going back to assembly line in a very consistent, predictable way. So that Arlon solves. Then you, you need to complement that with the right kind of observability and monitoring tools at scale, right? Because ultimately issues are going to happen and you're going to have to figure out, uh, you know, how to solve them fast. And Arlon, by the way, also helps in that direction. 
Um, but you also need observability tools. And then, uh, especially if you're running it on the public cloud, you need some cost management tools. So in my mind, these three things are like the most necessary ingredients uh, to make super cloud successful. And, uh, you know, our launch was in one Okay, so them. now the next level is, okay, that makes sense. It's under the covers, kind of speak, under the hood. Yeah. How does that impact the app developers of the cloud native modern application workflows? Because the impact to me seems the apps are going to be impacted. Are they going to be faster, stronger? I mean, what's the impact? If you do all those things as you mentioned, what's the impact of the apps? Yeah, the impact is that your apps are more likely to operate in production the way you expect them to because the right checks and balances have gone through and any discrepancies have been identified prior to those apps, prior to your customer running into them. Right? Because developers run into this challenge today where there's a split responsibility. Right? I'm responsible for my code, I'm responsible for some of these other plugins, but I don't own the stack end to end. I have to rely on my ops counterpart to do their part right. And so this really gives them you know, the right tooling for that. So this is actually a great kind of relevant point. You know, as cloud becomes uh, more scalable, you're starting to see this fragmentation gone are the days of the full stack developer um, to the more specialized role, but this is a key point. And I have to ask you, because if this Arlo solution takes place, as you say, and the apps are going to be do what they're designed to do, the question is, what do, does the current pain look like? Are the apps breaking? What is the signals to the customer yeah. that they should be calling you guys up and implementing Arlo, Argo, and, and all the other goodness? to automate, what are some of the signals? Is it downtime, is it, is it failed apps, is it latency? What are some of the things yeah, that, absolutely. that would be in, indications of things are effed up a little bit? Yeah, um, more frequent downtimes, downtimes that, are, that take longer to triage, and so your, you know, uh, the, the, you know, your mean times on resolution, et cetera, are escalating or growing larger, right? Like we have environments of customers where uh, they have a number of folks on, in the field that have to take these apps and run them at customer sites, and that's one of our partners, and they're extremely interested in this because the, the, the rate of failures they're encountering for this, you know, the field uh, when they're running these apps on site, because the field is automating their clusters that are running on sites using their own scripts. So these are the kinds of challenges, and th those are the pain points, which is, um, you know, if you're looking to reduce uh, your mean time to resolution, if you're looking to reduce the number of failures that occur on your production site, that's one. And second, if you're looking to manage these at scale environments with a relatively small focus nimble ops team, um, which has an immediate impact on your budget. Um, so those are, those are the signals. This is the cloud native at scale um, situation, the innovation going on. Final thought is your reaction to the idea that if the world goes digital, which it is, uh, and the confluence of physical and digital coming together, and cloud continues to do its thing, the company becomes the application, not where IT used to be supporting the business, you know, the back office and the maybe terminals and some PCs and handhelds. Now, if technology is running the business, is the business, yeah. the company is the application, yeah. so it can't be down. So there's a <laughs> lot of pressure on, on CSOs and CIOs now and, C, and boards to saying, how is technology driving the top line revenue? That's the number one conversation. Do yeah. you see the same thing? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I think there's multiple pressures at the CXO CIO level, right? One is that there needs to be that visibility and clarity and guarantee almost that you know the the, the technology that's uh, you know that's going to drive your top line is going to drive that in a consistent, reliable, predictable manner. And then second, there is the constant pressure to do that while always lowering your costs of doing it, right? Especially when you're talking about uh, let's say retailers or those kinds of large scale vendors, they many times make money by lowering the amount that they spend on you know, providing those goods to their end customers. So I think those, both those factors kind of come into play and the solution to all of them is usually in a very structured strategy around automation. Final question, what does cloud native at scale look like to you? If all the things happen the way we want them to happen, the magic wand, the magic dust, what does it look like? What that looks like to me is a um, CIO sipping uh, at his desk uh, on coffee, 
production is running absolutely <laughs> smooth and his he's running that at a nimble nimble team size of at the most a handful of folks that are just looking after things but things are just taking care of the CIO doesn't exist there's no CISO <laughs> there at the beach yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you for coming on sharing the cloud native at scale here on theCUBE thank you for your time fantastic thanks for having me okay I'm John Furrier here for a special program presentation special programming cloud native at scale enabling super cloud modern applications with Platform 9. Thanks for watching. Welcome back everyone to the special presentation of Cloud Native at Scale. The Cube and Platform 9 special presentation going in and digging into the next generation super cloud infrastructure as code and the future of application development. We're here with Bick Lee, who's the chief architect and co-founder of Platform 9. Bick, great to see you. Cube alumni, we, we met at an OpenStack event in about eight years ago or yeah. later, earlier, uh, when OpenStack was going. Great to see you and great to congratulations see. on the success of Platform 9. Thank you very much. Yeah, you guys have been at this for a while and this is really the, the, the year we're seeing the, the crossover. Mm -hmm. of Kubernetes because of what happens with containers. Everyone now has realized, and you've seen what Docker's doing with the new Docker, the open source Docker now, just the success exactly. of containerization. Right. And now the Kubernetes layer that we've been working on for years is coming bearing fruit. This is huge. Yeah, exactly, yes. And so as infrastructure as code comes in, we talked to Baskar talking about super cloud, I met her about you know the new R lawn, R R lawn. Um, you guys just launched. The infrastructure as code is going to another level. And it's always been DevOps, infrastructure as code. That's been the ethos. That's been like from day one. Developers, just code. Then you saw the rise of serverless. And you see now multi-cloud are on the horizon. Connect the dots for us. What is the state of infrastructure as code today? So I, th I think, um... I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, everybody or most people know about infrastructure as code, but with Kubernetes, I think um, that project has uh, evolved the concept even further, and these days it's um, uh, infrastructure as configuration, right? So, uh, which is an evolution of infrastructure as code. So instead of telling the system, here's how I want my infrastructure by telling it, you know, do step A, B, C, and D, uh, Instead, with uh, Kubernetes, you can describe your desired state declaratively using things called manifest resources, and then the system kind of magically figures it out and tries to converge the state towards the one that you specify. So I think it's it's a even better version of infrastructure as code. Yeah, yeah. And, and that really means it's developer just accessing resources. Okay, not declare. Okay, give me some compute. Stand me up some. Turn exactly. the lights on. Turn them off. Turn them on. That's kind of where we see this going. And I like the configuration piece. Some people say composability. I mean, now with open source so popular, mm -hmm. you don't have to have to write a lot of code. There's code being developed. Um, and so it's integration, it's configuration. These are areas that we're starting to see computer science principles around automation, machine learning, assisting open source, because you got a lot of code. That's You're right. Hearing uh, software supply chain issues. So infrastructure as code has to factor in these new dynamics. Can you share your opinion on um, these new dynamics of as open source grows, the glue layers, the configurations, the integration, what are the core issues? I think uh, one of the uh, major core issues is um, with all that power comes uh, complexity, right? So, um, you know, despite its expressive power, uh, systems like Kubernetes and declarative APIs let you express a lot of complicated and complex um, stacks, right? But you're dealing with um, hundreds, if not thousands of these YAML files or resources. And so I think, uh, you know, the emergence of systems and layers to help you manage that complexity is becoming a key challenge and opportunity in, in this space. That, that's I wrote a LinkedIn yeah. post today, it was comments about, you know, hey, enterprise is the new breed. The trend of SaaS companies moving, uh, our consumer-like comp consumer thinking into the enterprise has been happening for a long time, but now more than ever, you're seeing it. The old way used to be solve complexity with more complexity <laughs> and then lock the customer in. Now with open source, it's speed, simplification, 
and integration, right? These are the new dynam power dynamics for developers. Yeah. So as companies are starting to now deploy and look at Kubernetes, what are the things that need to be in place? Because you have some, I won't say technical debt, but maybe some shortcuts, some scripts here that make it look like infrastructure as code. People yeah. have done some things to simulate or, or make infrastructure as code happen. Yes. But to do it at scale yes. is harder. What's your take on this? What's your view? It's hard because there's a pr proliferation of methods, tools, technologies. Um, so for example, today, um, it's very common for DevOps and platform engineering tools, I mean, sorry, teams, to have to deploy a large number of Kubernetes clusters, but then apply the applications and configurations on top of those clusters. And they're using a wide range of tools to do this, right? For example, maybe Ansible or Terraform or Bash scripts to bring up the infrastructure and then the clusters. And then they may use a different set of tools uh, such as um, uh, Argo CD or other tools to apply configurations and applications on top of the clusters. So you have this sprawl of tools. You also, you also have this sprawl of configurations and files because the more objects you're dealing with, uh, the more um, uh, resources you have to manage. And there's a risk of drift, that people call that, where you know you think you have things under control, but some people from various teams will make changes here and there, and then before the end of the day, systems break and you have no idea of tracking them. So I think there's real need to kind of unify, simplify, and try to solve these problems using a smaller, more unified set of tools and methodologies. And that's something that we try to do with this new project, uh, Arlon. Yeah, so, so we're going to get to Arlon in a second. Yeah. I want to get into the why Arlon. You guys announced that at um, ArgoCon, um, which was put on here in Silicon Valley at the, at the Computer History by Intuit. They had their own little day over there at their headquarters. But before we get there, um, Baskar, your CEO, came on and he talked about SuperCloud at our inaugural event. What's your definition of SuperCloud? If you had to kind of explain that to someone at a cocktail party or someone in the industry, technical, how would you look at the SuperCloud trend that's emerging, it's become a thing? What's your, what would be your contribution uh, to that definition or um, the narrative? Well, it's, it's, it's uh, funny because I've actually heard of the term for the first time today, uh, speaking to you earlier today. But I think based on what you said, I, I already get kind of some of the, the gist and the, the main concepts. It seems like uh, super cloud, the way I interpret that is, you know, um, clouds and infrastructure, um, programmable infrastructure, all of those things are becoming commodity in a way, and everyone's got their own flavor, but there's a real opportunity for um, people to solve real business problems by perhaps trying to abstract away, uh, you know, all of those various implementations and then building uh, uh, better abstractions that are perhaps business or application specific to help companies and businesses solve real business problems. Yeah, I remember, that's a great, great definition. I remember, not to date myself, but back in the old days, you know, IBM had a proprietary network operating system, so the DEC for the mini computer vendors, DECnet and SNA respectively. Um, but TCP IP came out of the OSI, the Open Systems Interconnect, and remember, Ethernet beat Token Ring out. <laughs> so not to get all nerdy for all the young kids out there, look, just look up Token Ring, you'll see, you've probably never heard of it, it's IBM's you know, uh, uh, connection to the internet at the, the layer two. Is Amazon the Ethernet, right? So if TCP IP could be the Kubernetes and the containers abstraction, that made the industry completely change at that point in history. So at every major inflection point where there's been serious industry change and wealth creation and business value, there's been an abstraction yes. somewhere. Yes. What's your reaction to that? I think um, this is, um, uh, I think, a saying that's been heard many times in this industry, and, and I forgot who originated it, but um, I think the saying goes like, uh, there's no problem that can't be solved with another layer of indirection, right? And we've seen this over and over and over again, where Amazon and its peers have inserted this layer that has simplified you know, computing and, and uh, infrastructure management. And I believe this trend is going to continue, right? The next set of problems um, are going to be solved with these 
uh, insertions of additional abstraction layers. I think that that's really a, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to continue. It's interesting. I just wrote another post today on LinkedIn called The Silicon Wars AMD stock is down. ARM has been on a rise. We've been reporting for many years now that ARM is going to be huge. It has become true. Um, if you look at the success of the infrastructure as a service layer uh, across the clouds, Azure, AWS, Amazon's clearly way ahead of everybody. The stuff that they're doing with the silicon and the physics and the the atoms, the pro, you know, this is where the innovation, they're going so deep and so strong mm. at IaaS. The more that they get, that gets, come on, they have more performance. So if you're an app developer, wouldn't you want the best performance? And you'd want to have the best abstraction layer that gives you the most ability to do infrastructure as code or infrastructure for configuration, for provisioning, for managing services. And you're seeing that today with service mesh. There's a lot of action going on in the service mesh area in, in this community of, of KubeCon, which we'll be covering. So that brings up the whole, what's next? You guys just announced Arlon at ArgoCon, which came out of Intuit. Mm -hmm. We've had Mariana Tessel at our SuperCloud event. She's the CTO. You know, they're all in the cloud. So they're contributed to that project. Where did Arlon come from? What was the origination? What's the purpose? Why Arlon? Why this announcement? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the inception of the project, uh, this was the result of um, us realizing that problem that we spoke about earlier, which is complexity, right? With all of this, uh, these clouds, these infrastructure, um, all the variations around, uh, you know, compute storage uh, networks, and um, the proliferation of tools we talked about, the Ansibles and Terraforms and Kubernetes itself, you can think of that as another tool, right? Um, we saw uh, a need to solve that complexity problem and especially for uh, people and users who use uh, Kubernetes at scale. So when you have you know, hundreds of clusters, thousands of applications, thousands of users spread out over many, many uh, locations, um, there, there needs to be um, a system that uh, helps simplify that management, right? So that means fewer tools, more expressive ways of describing the state that you want, and uh, more consistency. And, and that's why um, you know we built um, Arlon, and we built it um, recognizing that many of these problems or sub problems have already been solved. So Arlon doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. It instead um, rests on the shoulders of several giants, right? So for example, uh, Kubernetes is one building block. Uh, GitOps and Argo CD is another one, which is, provides a very uh, structured way of applying configuration. And then we have projects like uh, Cluster API and um, uh, Crossplane, which provide APIs for describing infrastructure. So Arlon takes all of those building blocks and uh, builds a thin layer which uh, gives users a very expressive way of uh, defining configuration and desired state. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the inception of and the And what's project. the benefit of that? What does that, give the, what does that give the developer or the user in this case? The developers, the, the platform engineer uh, team members, the DevOps engineers, they uh, get a, a ways to provision uh, not just infrastructure and clusters, but also applications and configurations, they get a way, uh, a system for provisioning, configuring, deploying, and doing lifecycle management in a, in a much simpler way, okay? Especially, as I said, if you're dealing with a large number of uh, applications. So it's like an operating fabric, if you will. Yes. For them. Okay, so let's get into what that means for up above and below the, the, this abstraction or thin layer. Um, below is the infrastructure. We talked a lot about what's going on below that. Yeah. Above our workloads. At the end of the day, you know, I talked to CXOs and um, IT folks that, have, that are now DevOps engineers. They care about the workloads. Mm -hmm. And they want the infrastructure's code to work. They don't want to spend their time getting in the weeds, figuring out what happened when, someone yes. made a push that, that happened or something happened. They need observability and they need to, to know that it's working. That's right. And is my workloads running effectively? So how do you guys look at the workload side? Because now you have multiple workloads on these fabric. Right. So workloads, um, so Kubernetes has defined kind of a standard way to describe workloads. And you can, uh, you know, uh, 
tell Kubernetes I want to run this container uh, this particular way. Or you can use other projects that are in the Kubernetes uh, uh, cloud native ecosystem, like Knative, where you can express your application in more uh, at a higher level, right? But what's also happening is, in addition to the workloads, um, DevOps and platform engineering teams, they need to uh, very often deploy the applications with the clusters themselves. Clusters are becoming this commodity. It's, it's becoming this um, uh, host for the application, and it kind of comes bundled with it in many cases. It's like an appliance, right? So DevOps teams have to provision clusters at a really incredible rate and they need to tear them down. Clusters are becoming more uh, It's coming ephemeral. like an EC2 instance. Yeah. Spin up a cluster. We've heard people that, use words like that. That's right. And before Arlon, you kind of had to do all of that uh, using a different set of tools, as, as I explained. So um, with Arlon, you can kind of express everything together. You can say, I want a cluster with a health monitoring stack and a logging stack and this ingress controller, and I want these applications and these security policies. You can describe all of that using something we call a profile, and then you can stamp out your, app, your applications and your clusters and manage them in a very... So essentially uh, standard, it creates a mechanism, exactly. standardized declarative kind of configurations, and it's like a playbook. You exactly. just deploy it. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difference between, say, a script? Like, I'm, I have scripts, I can just automate scripts. Or... Yes, this is where that um, declarative API uh, and um, uh, infrastructure as configuration comes in, right? Because uh, scripts, yes, you can automate scripts, but the order in which they run matters, right? Um, they can break, things can break in the middle, and, um, and sometimes you need to debug them, whereas the declarative way is much more expressive and powerful. You just tell the system what you want, and then the system kind of uh, figures it out. And uh, there are these things called controllers, which will, in the background, reconcile all the state to converge towards your desired state. It's a much more powerful, expressive, and reliable way of getting things done. So infrastructure as configuration is built kind of on, it's a superset of infrastructure as code. Because it's you have, an evolution. You need edge as code, but then you can configure the code by just saying do it. You're basically right. declaring and saying go, go do that. That's right. Okay, so, all right, so cloud native at scale. Take me through your vision of what that means. Someone says, hey, what does cloud native at scale mean? What's success look like? Um, how does it roll out in the future as you, not future, next couple of years? I mean, people are now starting to figure out, okay, it's not as easy as it sounds. Kubernetes has value. We're going to hear this year at KubeCon a lot of this. What does cloud native at scale mean? Yeah, th there are different uh, interpretations, but uh, if you ask me, when people think of scale, they think of a large number of deployments, right? Um, uh, geographies, um, many, you know, supporting thousands or tens or millions of, of users, there, there's that aspect to scale. There's also um, an equally important a uh, aspect of scale, which is also something that uh, we, we try to address with Arlon, and that is just complexity for the people operating this or configuring this, right? So in order to describe that uh, desired state and in order to perform things like maybe upgrades or updates on a very large scale. You want the humans behind that to be able to express and direct the system to do that in, in relatively simple terms, right? And so um, we want um, uh, the tools and the abstractions uh, and the mechanisms available to the user to be as powerful but as simple as possible. So there's, I think there's going to be um, a, a number, uh, and there have been a number of uh, CNCF and cloud native projects that are trying to attack that uh, complexity problem as well. And Arlon kind of falls in, in that category. Okay, so I'll put you on the spot. We've got KubeCon coming up, and obviously yeah. this will be shipping this seg series out before. Mm -hmm. What do you expect to see at KubeCon this year? What's the big story this year? What's the What's the most important thing happening? Is it uh, in the open source community and also within a lot of the, the people jockeying for leadership. And there's a lot of projects. And still there's some white space in the overall systems map about the different areas get runtime and there's availability in all these different areas. Mm -hmm. What's the, where's the action? Where the, where's the smoke? Where's the fire? Where's the peace? Where's the tension? 
Yeah, so uh, I think uh, one thing that has been happening over the past couple of Cube cons, and I expect to continue, and, and that is uh, the, the word on the street is Kubernetes is getting boring, right? Which is good, right? <laughs> boring means simple. <laughs> well, um, well, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> invisible. Uh, no drama, right? So, so the the rate of change uh, of the Kubernetes features and, and all that has slowed, but in in a, in a positive way. Um, but um, there's still a general sentiment and uh, feeling that there's just too much stuff. If you look at a stack necessary for uh, uh, hosting applications based on Kubernetes. There are just still too many moving parts, too many uh, components, right? Um, too much complexity. I go, I keep going back to the complexity problem. So I expect um, uh, KubeCon and all the vendors and the players and the startups and the people there to continue to focus on that uh, complexity problem and introduce uh, further simplifications uh, to, to the stack. Vic, you've had a storied career, VMware, uh, over decades with them, uh, obviously with 12 years, with 14 years, or something like that, big number. Um, Co-founder here at Platform, and you guys have been around for a while mm -hmm. at this game. Uh, we, I mean, we talked about OpenStack, that project, you, we interviewed at one of their events. So OpenStack was the beginning of that, this new revolution. I remember the early days, it, was, it wasn't so much to be an alternative to Amazon, but it was a way to do more cloud, cloud native. I think we had a Cloudarati team at that time. We would joke, we you know about the, about the dream. It's happening now. Now at Platform Nine, you guys have been doing this for a while. What's the what are you most excited about as the chief architect? What did you guys double down on? What did you guys tr pivot from or to? Did you do any pivots? Did you extend out certain areas? Because you guys are in a good position right now. A lot of DNA in cloud native. Mm -hmm. um, what are you most excited about? And what does Platform Nine bring to the table? Uh, for customers and for people in the industry uh, watching this? Yeah, so I think our mission really hasn't changed over the years, right? It's been always about taking complex open source software because open source software, it's powerful, it solves new problems you know, every year and you have new things coming out all, all the time, right? OpenStack was an example when the Kubernetes uh, took the world by storm. But uh, there's always that complexity of you know, just configuring it, deploying it, running it, um, operating it. And uh, our mission has always been that we will take all that complexity and just make it, you know, easy for users to consume, regardless of the technology, right? So the successor to Kubernetes, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, you have some indications that people are... Um, coming up of new and simpler ways of running applications. Uh, there are many projects uh, around there. Who knows what's coming uh, next year or the <laughs> year after that. But Platform will, uh, Platform 9 will be there yeah. and um, we will um, you know, take the innovations from the, the, the community. We will contribute our own innovations and make all of those uh, things uh, very consumable to uh, customers. Simpler, faster, cheaper, exactly. always a good business model. Technically to make that yes. happen. Yeah, I think the reigning in the chaos is key. You know, now we have now visibility into the scale. Final question before we depart on yeah, this segment. Um, what is at scale? How many clusters do you see that would be a, a, high, a watermark for an at scale conversation around a, an enterprise? Um, is it workloads we're looking at or our clusters? How would you, yeah. how would you describe that? And when people try to squint through and evaluate what's a scale, what's the at scale kind of threshold? Yeah, and the number of clusters doesn't tell the whole story because clusters can be small in terms of the number of nodes or they can be large. But uh, roughly speaking, when we say, you know, large scale uh, cluster deployments, we're talking about um, maybe uh, hundreds, uh, two thousands. Yeah. And final, final question, what's the role of the hyperscalers? You got AWS continuing to do well, but they got their core, IaaS, they got a PaaS. They're not too, too much putting a SaaS out there, they have some SaaS apps, but mostly it's the ecosystem. They have marketplaces doing over $2 billion, billions of transactions a year. Um, and, and it's just like just sitting there. It hasn't really, they're now innovating on it, but that's going to change ecosystems. What's the role the cloud play in the cloud native at scale? The, the hyperscale yeah, themselves? Yeah, AWS, for instance. Yeah, AWS, Azure, Google. Uh, you mean from a business perspective? Yeah, well, because technical. They're, they're, they have their own interests that, you know, they're, they're uh, they will keep catering to. They, 
they will continue to find ways to lock <laughs> uh, their users into their ecosystem of uh, services and, and APIs. Um, so I don't think that's going to change, right? Yeah. They're just going to keep. Well, they got great uh, performance. I mean, from a, from a hardware standpoint. Yes. Um, that's going to be key, right? Yes, I think the uh, the move from x86 being the dominant way uh, and platform to run workloads. Uh, is changing, right? That, 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 and, and I think the, the hyperscalers really want to be in the game in terms of, you know, the, the new risk and ARM, yeah. um, ecosystems and, yeah. and the platforms. Yeah, not uh, joking aside, Paul Moritz, when he was the CEO of uh, VMware, when he took over, once said, and I remember our first year doing the Cube, oh, the cloud is one big distributed computer. It's, it's hardware. And you got software and you got middleware. And, uh, he kind of oversimple, he's kind of tongue in cheek, but really you're talking about large compute and sets of services. That is essentially a distributed computer. Yes, exactly. It's, we're back in the same game. <laughs> Vic, thank you for coming on the segment. Appreciate your time. This is a, a cloud native at scale, special presentation with Platform 9, really unpacking super cloud, Arlon, open source, and how to run large scale applications on uh, the cloud, cloud native develop for developers. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching and we'll stay tuned for another great segment coming right up. Hey, welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 22. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here all day talking about the future of cloud, where it's all going, making it super, multi-clouds around the corner, and public cloud is winning. Got the private cloud on premise and edge. Got a great guest here, Baskar Gorty, CEO of Platform9, just on the panel on Kubernetes, an enabler, a blocker. Welcome back, great to have you on. Good to see you again. So yeah. Kubernetes is a blocker enabler, by, by, with a question mark I put on, on their panel, it was really to discuss the role of Kubernetes. Now, Great conversation, operations is impacted. But what's interesting about what you guys are doing at Platform 9 is your role there as CEO and the company's position, kind of like the world spun into the direction of Platform 9 while yeah, you're at the helm. Right, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, things are moving very well and since they came to us, <laughs> uh, it was an insight to call ourselves the platform company eight years ago, right? Um, so absolutely, whether you are doing it in public clouds or private clouds, um, you know, the application world is moving very fast in trying to become digital and cloud native. There are many options for you to run the infrastructure. The biggest blocking factor now is having a unified platform, and that's what we come into. Pastor, we were talking before we came on stage here about your background, and we were kind of talking about the glory days in 2000, 2001. Yeah when the first ASP's application service providers came out. Kind of a SaaS vibe, but that was kind of all kind of cloud-like. It was. And, and web services started then too, so you saw that whole growth. Now fast forward 20 years later, 22 years later, where we are now. When you look back then to here, and all the different cycles. In fact, you know, as we were talking offline, you know, I was in one of those ASP's uh, in the year 2000 where it was a novel concept of saying we are providing a software and a capability as a service, right? You sign up and start using it. Um, I think a lot has changed since then. Uh, the, the tooling, the tools, the technology has really skyrocketed. The app development environment has really taken off exceptionally well. There are many, many choices of infrastructure now, right? So I think things are in a way the same, but also extremely different. But more importantly, now for any company, regardless of size, to be a digital native, to become a digital company is extremely mission critical. It's no longer a nice to have. Everybody's in the journey somewhere. Everyone is going digital transformation. Here, even on a so-called downturn, recession that's upcoming, inflation's here. It's interesting, this is the first downturn in the history of the world where the hyperscale clouds have been pumping on all cylinders as an economic input. And if you look at the tech trends, GDP's down, but not tech. No. Nope. Because the pandemic showed everyone digital transformation is here and more spend and more growth is coming, even in, in tech. So this is a unique factor, which proves 
that that digital transformation is happening. And company, every company will need a super cloud. Everyone, every company, regardless of size, regardless of location, has to become modernize their infrastructure. And modernizing infrastructure is not just some you know, new servers and new application tools, it's your approach, how you're serving your customers, how you're bringing agility in your organization. Mm -hmm. I think that is becoming a necessity for every enterprise to survive. I want to get your thoughts on SuperCloud because one of the things Dave Vellante and I wanted yep. to do with SuperCloud and calling it that was, we, I, I personally, and I know Dave as well, he can, I'll speak for, he can speak for himself, so we didn't like multi-cloud. I mean, not because Amazon said, don't call things multi-cloud. It just didn't feel right. I mean, everyone has multiple clouds by default. If you're running productivity software, you have Azure and Office 365. But it wasn't truly distributed. It wasn't truly decentralized. It wasn't truly cloud enabled. It didn't, it felt like they're not ready for a market yet. Yet public cloud's booming on premise, private cloud and edge is much more, on, you know, more, more dynamic, more, right. more think, real. Yeah, I think the reason why we think super cloud is a better term than multi-cloud. Multi-cloud are more than one cloud, but they're disconnected, okay? You have a productivity cloud, you have a Salesforce cloud, you may have, everyone has an internal cloud, right? Um, so, But they're not connected. So you can say, okay, it's more than one cloud, so it's, you know, multi-cloud. But super cloud is where you are actually trying to look at this holistically, whether it is on-prem, whether it is public, whether it's at the edge, at the store, at the branch, you are looking at this as one unit. And that's where we see the, word, the term super cloud is more applicable. Because what are the qualities that you require if you're in a super cloud, right? You need choice of infrastructure, you need but at the same time, you need a single pane or a single platform for you to build your innovations on, regardless of which cloud you're doing it on, right? So I think super cloud is actually a more tightly integrated, orchestrated management uh, philosophy, we think. So let's get into some of the super cloud type trends that we've been reporting on. Again, the purpose of this event is, to, is as a pilot is to get the conversations flowing with, with the influencers like yourselves who are re running companies and building products and the builders. Uh, Amazon and Azure are doing extremely well. Google's coming up in third. Cloud works in public cloud. We see the use cases, on-premises use cases. Kubernetes has been an interesting phenomenon because it's become from the developer side a little bit, but a lot of ops people love Kubernetes. It's really more of an ops thing. You mentioned OpenStack earlier. Kubernetes kind of came out of that OpenStack. We need an orchestration. And then containers had a good shot with, with Docker. They repivoted the company. Now they're all in on open source. So you got containers booming, and Kubernetes as a new layer there. What's uh, what's the take on that? What does that really mean? Is that a new de facto enabler? It is here. It's for here for sure. Every enterprise somewhere else in the journey is going on, and you know most companies are seventy plus percent of them have one, two, three container-based Kubernetes-based applications now being rolled out. Um, so it's very much here. Uh, it is in production at scale by many customers. Um, and it, the beauty of it is, yes, open source, but the biggest gating factor is the skill set. And that's where we have a phenomenal engineering team, yeah. right? So it's, it's one thing to buy a tool. And just to be clear, one. you're a managed service for Kubernetes. We provide, uh, provide a, a software platform for cloud acceleration as a service and it can run anywhere. It can run in public, private. Mm -hmm. We have customers who do it in truly multi-cloud environments. Uh, it runs on the edge. Uh, it runs at this, in stores. There are thousands of stores in a retailer. Um, so we provide that. And also, for specific segments where data sovereignty and data residency are key regulatory reasons, we also run on-prem as an air gap version. Can you give an example on how you guys are deploying your platform to enable a super cloud experience for your customer. Right, so I'll give you two different examples. One is a very large networking company, public networking company. They have I don't know, hundreds of products, hundreds of R&D teams that are building different, different products. Um, and if you look at a few years back, each one was doing it on a different platform, but they really needed to bring the agility um, and they worked with us now over three years where we are their build, test, dev platform where all their products are built on, 
right? And it has dramatically increased their agility to release new products. Number two, it actually is a lights out operation. In fact, the customer says, like, like the Maytag service person, because we provide it as a service and it barely takes one or two people to maintain it for them. So it's kind of like an SRE vibe. One person managing a large... 4,000 engineers building infrastructure. On their tools, whatever they On their they tools. Do. Uh, they're using whatever app development tools they use, but they use our platform uh, and what benefits service. are they seeing? Are they seeing speed? Speed, definitely. Okay. Definitely they're speeding speed. Uniformity, because now they're building, able to build. So their customers who are using product A and product B are seeing a similar set of tools that are being used. So a big problem that's coming out of this super cloud event that we're, we're seeing, and we've heard it all here, ops and security teams, because they're kind of two part of one team, but ops and security specifically need to catch up speed-wise. Are you delivering to that value to ops and security? Right, so we, we work with ops and security teams and infrastructure teams, and we layer on top of that. We are like a platform team. If you think about it, depending on where you have data centers, where you have infrastructure, you'll have multiple teams, okay? Um, but you need a unified platform. Who's your buyer? Uh, our buyer is usually, you know, the product divisions of companies that are looking at, or the CTO would be a buyer for us uh, functionally, CIO definitely. Um, so it, it's, it's somewhere in the DevOps to infrastructure, but the ideal one we are beginning to see now, many large corporations are really looking at it as a platform and saying we have a platform group on which any app can be developed and it is run on any infrastructure. So the platform engineering team. So you were in two sides of that coin. You've got the dev side and then and the infrastructure side. side. Okay. Another customer that I give you an example, which I would say is kind of the edge of the store. So they have thousands of stores. Retail. Retail, you know, food retailer, okay. right? They have thousands of stores around the globe, 50,000, 60,000, and they really want to enhance the customer experience that happens when you either order the product or go into the store and pick up your product or buy or browse or sit there. Um, they have applications that were written in the 90s. And then they have very modern AI ML applications today. Mm -hmm. They want something that will not have to send an IT person to install a rack in the store. Or they can't move everything to the cloud because the store operations has to be local. Uh, uh, the menu changes based on... It's a classic edge. It's a classic edge, yeah. right? They can't send... IT people to go install racks of servers. Then they can't sell software people to go install the software. And any change you want to put, do that. You know, truck rolls. So they've been working with us where all they do is they ship, depending on the size of the store, one or two or three little servers with instructions that... You say you, little servers, like how big? One, yeah. like a net pizza box. box, like a small yeah. little pizza box. box. Right. Yeah. Um, and all the person in the store has to do like what you and I do at home and we get a, uh, you know, a router, is connect the power, connect the internet, and sw turn the switch on. And from there, we pick it up. Yep. We provide the operating system, everything, and then the applications are put on it. And so that dramatically brings the velocity for them. They manage thousands Through of them. Through plug and play. Through plug and play, thousands of stores. They manage it centrally. We do it for them, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's another example where on the edge, then we have some customers who have both a large private presence and one of the public clouds, mm -hmm. okay? But they want to have the same platform layer of orchestration and management that they can use regardless of the location. So you guys got some success, congratulations, got Thank some you. traction there, it's awesome. The question I want to ask you is, that's come up is, what is truly cloud native? Because there's lift and shift of the cloud. That's not but cloud then, native. Then there's cloud native. Cloud native seems to be the driver for the super cloud. How do you talk to customers? How do you explain when someone says, what's cloud native, what isn't cloud native? Right, look, I think, uh, first of all, the best place uh, to look at what is the definition and what are the attributes and characteristics of what is truly a cloud native is CNCF foundation. And I think it's very well documented, very well written. KubeCon, of course, you know, Detroit's coming so, up. So it's already there, right? Um, so we follow that very closely, right? I think just lifting and shifting your 20-year-old application onto a data center somewhere is not cloud native, okay? You can't port to cloud native. You have to rewrite and redevelop your application and business logic using modern tools, hopefully more open source, and, and I think that's what cloud native is, and we are seeing a lot of our customers in that journey. Now, everybody wants to be cloud native, mm -hmm. but it's not that easy. 
okay because it's i think it's first of all skill set is very important uniformity of uh, tools that there's so many tools there are thousands and thousands of tools you could spend your time figuring out which tool to use <laughs> okay um, so i think the complexity is there but the business benefits of agility uh, and uniformity and customer experience are truly being done and i'll give you an example i don't know how clear native they are right and they're not a customer of ours um but you order pizzas you do right if you just watch the pizza industry how dominos actually increased their share and mind share and wallet share was not because they were making better pizzas or not i don't know anything about that but the whole experience of how you order how you watch what's happening how it's delivered they were the pioneer in it to me those are the kinds of customer experiences that cloud native can provide being agility and having that flow to the application changes what the expectations of the are for the customer customer the customer's expectations change right once you get used to a better customer experience you will not that's got to wrap it up i want to just get your perspective again one of the benefits of chatting with you here and having you part of the super cloud 22 is you've seen many cycles you have in, a lot of insights i want to ask you given your career where you've been and what you've done and now the ceo of platform 9 how would you compare what's happening now with other inflection points in the industry and you've been again you've been an entrepreneur you sold your company to oracle you've been seeing the the big companies you've seen the different waves what's going on right now put into context this yeah. moment in time sure. around super cloud sure i think as you said a lot of battle scars <laughs> uh, been uh, um uh, been in an asp been in a real time uh software company been in large enterprise software houses and a transformation um i've been on the app side i did the infrastructure right and then tried to build our own platforms i've gone through all of this myself with a uh, lot of uh, lessons learned in there i think this is an event which is happening now for companies to go through cl to become cloud native and digitalized if i were to look back and look at some parallels of the tsunami <laughs> uh, that's going on is a couple of parallels come to me one is think of it which was forced to on us like y2k mm -hmm. everybody around the world had to have a plan a strategy and an execution for y2k i would say the next big thing was e-commerce i think e-commerce has been pervasive right across all industries and disruptive and disruptive extremely yeah. disruptive if you did not adapt and adapt and accelerate your e-commerce initiative you were it was an existence yeah. question yeah i think we are at that pivotal moment now in companies trying to become digital and cloud native you know, that is what i see happening i now. think that that e-commerce is interesting and i think just to riff with you on that is that it's disrupting and refactoring the business models I think that is something that's coming out of this is that it's not just completely changing the game it's just changing how you operate how you think and how you operate see if you think about the early days of e-commerce just putting up a shopping cart didn't made you an e-commerce or a yeah. e, e retailer or a e e e customer <laughs> right or, uh, so i think it's the same thing now is i think this is a fundamental shift on how you're thinking about your business mm -hmm. how are you going to operate how are you going to service your customers i think it requires that just um lift and shift is not going to work askar thank you for coming on spending the time to come in and share with our community and being part of supercloud 22 we really appreciate it. we're going to keep this open we're going to keep this conversation going even after the event to open up and look at the structural changes happening now and continue to look at it in the open in the community and we're going to keep this going for for a long long time as we get answers to the problems that customers are looking for with cloud cloud computing i'm john for with super cloud 22 in the cube thanks for watching thank you thank you john Hello, welcome back. This is the end of our program, our special presentation with Platform 9 on cloud native at scale, enabling the super cloud. We're continuing the theme here. You heard the interview, super cloud and its challenges, new opportunities around the solutions around like Platform 9 and others with Arlon. This is really about the edge situations on the internet and managing the edge, multiple regions, 
uh, avoiding vendor lock-in. This is what this new super cloud is all about, the business consequences we heard, and, and the wide-ranging conversations around what it means for open source and the complexity problem all being solved. I hope you enjoyed this program. There's a lot of moving pieces and things to configure with cloud native install, all making it easier for you here with SuperCloud and of course Platform 9 contributing to that. Thank you for watching. Thank you.